we do belay stretches <laughs> we stretch our neck so it's always like the first climber has like a little bit of like do i remember how to do this <laughs> b category climbers prefer not to have like a super soft and like graceful fall they would rather just be caught so they can feel that the rope is catching them there was one climber that made contact with the ground um, from like the second or third bolt Welcome to another episode of the That's Not Real Climbing podcast. I'm your host, Jenny, and I'm excited to introduce my guest for today, Noah Makaibi. Noah is the assistant belay coordinator at USA Climbing, and he has volunteer belayed nationally and internationally at IFSC Youth Worlds in 2022. In this episode, we'll learn about how to get into volunteer belaying, some interesting tidbits on belay devices and catching falls that you may not have thought about before, what some of the differences are between belaying for different paraclimbing classifications, and some of the bad catches and falls that he has had to witness. Hope you enjoy this episode with Noah. A lot of the audience is international, um, and I think even in general, people don't really know too much about the belaying world, so I think this will be a good opportunity to get into that stuff. Um, But before we get into the details of that, how did you get into climbing and volunteering and belaying? Yeah, so starting with climbing, um, I've only been climbing for coming up to five years in December. So I haven't been climbing for too long. Um, I started before that, just like in the outdoor outdoors. Um, I did canyoneering, which kind of ties into belaying and in a little bit, but canyoneering, just like slot canyons and rappelling and like going down very narrow sandstone was where I started of like, oh, this is really cool. Just like high stress adventure outdoors then leading towards um yeah just like got a gym membership off a whim of like being a coloradan you kind of are obligated to participate in outdoor recreation and climbing is one of those things that you sometimes some people will participate in so i had a lot of friends that um were into climbing and then i just thought i think i would enjoy this i like canyoneering i like I have rope technique already baseline. So moved from that to then climbing and then just fell in love with the ways that the community interacted with itself. And then with the outdoors is what made me stick. Um, And then getting into competition belaying was um, my gym that I was a member at. Uh, They had a, a regional or it was kind of a divisional event It was weird because it was like put right after COVID. So in 2021, I think it was May or June of 2021, I um, just was a random volunteer on a sign-up genius. (laughs) It's often like that. Yeah. Um, I initially was not picked to um, belay. Like the, the head belayer who became my mentor after a little bit, Phil Holbert, was like, hey, we had a really crazy round last round and I asked the belayers from last session to, to stick around for the second session. And I sadly like, because of, um, just the, the climate of the competition, I really don't have a space for you. And I thought, okay, great. I guess I'll just go home. Like I'd prepared for, for belaying that day. And then, um, I, yeah, I like was like, okay, bummer. Maybe I'll see something else that I could do. And then I like turned back around and I said, I really want to do this actually. Like I, I, I've seen competition climbing. Yeah. I I really want to belay. Like I would like to belay maybe after this event nationally. And he said, I don't know. I I'll see if I can get you on the team. And then his daughter bowed out from that round. And then he was like, Hey, my daughter, um, didn't, didn't want to belay this round, so we have a spot for you if you wanted to. Belay. Okay, great. Like this seems super fun, and then I had like had a really good round. My first round using a gree gree, which we'll get into belay devices later. I'm pretty sure, but uh, yeah, I was using a gree gree and like giving soft catches. I remember there was one athlete like as we as I was performing a catch, like we collided a little bit. Um, but 
overall, he was like, yeah, you have really good like rope control. You don't short rope. Um, you provide soft catches. Like this seems good enough for me. Um, I'll give you a word for the national crew. So that's where it started was that one event. That was fast. Just signing up. Yeah. Like what was the initial reason why he didn't want you to belay at first? Like just because I guess I don't really get why because the ground was crazy. They wanted to keep the same belayers for the for the second round. Yeah. Um, this is something that happens a lot in like the Phil Holbert was in the head belayer role. When you're in the head belayer role, you kind of have to if you are coming into another round knowing it's crazy and you have like other random people from the sign up genius that have signed up for this round, like it's a lot harder to get them on the same page than just having the people from the previous session belay for the next round of like, hey, there's a lot of safety hazards. I would rather the people that are familiar with the safety hazards stay on the route for the next round rather than having to reorient the whole entire new belay crew for the next session. So um, I definitely understand his reasoning behind it. But what were some of like the safety hazards? I think it just was like really tough catches on slab and like weird placement of draws and where the catch was happening. I didn't really see it i wasn't really a part of the scene at that point i just had belayed that one round and then uh yeah so i wasn't aware what like safety or just like parts of the the previous round that made it really challenging for this next round for me to possibly not get picked but overall everything worked out and yeah it's alina's it's alina's fault that i'm here (laughs) i I think that's pretty funny Well, it's kind of interesting. I guess I find it like pretty ballsy that you signed up to belay and then like explicitly said that you wanted to belay when you got turned away. Um, Because I think I've like volunteered in the past through like sign up genius and you can sign up to belay and stuff. But I was like, I feel like this is something that should require some sort of, I don't know, course or clinic just to like keep things consistent so i just signed up for judging instead or something like that which seems a little bit less dangerous and risky so it's interesting that you i don't know really wanted to do it so badly i had been told i was a good belayer so i was like yeah i think it'd be cool to try it in a competition setting like i don't know i don't know what to 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 think about it um (laughs) <laughs> yeah and, and possibly that's just me speaking into the just my privilege but also i think i i did kind of know that i deserve to be there in terms of like yeah i'm a good belayer i really want to try i want to put in the work um which then also helped me get onto the team uh so you started out i guess with no experience and then you kind of made your way in there um now that comp climbing is a little bit more um popular i guess do you are there ever going to be like courses or like qualifications that you need to become like a volunteer belayer yeah so um a lot of what has developed over time like when i started it was just me signing up on a sign up genius Uh, For those that aren't familiar, it's just like a Google form that you can just add your name of, hey, I want to judge for this round or I want to help in ISO during this time slot. Um, That's where the belayers would come from is just like uh, either a parent that wanted to volunteer to help out with the event or just for me was I just wanted to belay. yeah, so that's what it started, and then um, it's taken time to develop the belay program to then be something where um, if you are working like regionals or divisionals event, it's very helpful to have endorsement. So we don't have a certification system, um, something to clear pretty readily. Uh, we don't certify people. What we do is we have vetted people vet people so people that have a lot of experience um throughout all disciplines like 
um, just going into how the the series and USA climbing is broken down is a lot of it starts in the youth series, um, which is it's like an IFSC for its own country where it's a big federation with small divisions and regions or divisions then broken down to regions. So there's, um, I believe there's 18 regions in all of the United States, which is huge. Um, so with the youth series, it's being broken down into 18 regions that then go into divisionals and then divisionals go into nationals for youth. Um, the, the way that we've broken down endorsement for belaying is people that have belayed at divisional events, um, have more say or have more endorsement than people that have, um, no experience. Like for me, if I had just randomly signed up for a national events, I would probably be turned away, but because I had experience at a divisional event. I was able to be on a national team within that same year of, of 2021. So yeah, kind of, I don't know if that's fully answering your question, but um, it used to be just parents of athletes signing up to volunteer to belay for whatever reason, and then has now become more of a formalized system over time, um, which is like, I think it started more and more towards like 2018 of when vetting became a part of um, growing into what the U- the USA Climbing National Belay uh, program looks like now. So yeah, all that to say, yeah, like there's been a lot of time to now take the space of, okay, the people that have worked national events can now be the people to endorse or to create teams for regional and divisional qualifying events before regionals um to then work towards like oh who's gonna belay for national team trials which is probably the most like premier event for the top athletes of the nation um and we we like to have a lot of belay skill because there's a lot of belay skill needed um if if you were following any of national team trials this last year uh yeah there was some there was some rowdy qualification and semifinal routes do you feel like the current system of just like vetting the people you know at like regionals and divisionals is sufficient or do you feel like there needs to be more work towards like a certification process i i think it's hard to to say a certification process would i don't think it would i don't think it would not help or not serve athletes very well I don't know if that's where we can create like the most like rigid standards. Um, Endorsement, I feel like is the most helpful because um, you can take a lot of people with varying abilities and like um, belay standards or just standards that people have for belaying differ throughout the whole entire country. Like, um, working in a climbing gym like my experience is you'll see people that have an old school style belay that's like a supinated hand as their brake hand and then their other hand is just sliding rope through which was is not the industry standard anymore so um for purposes of equity if you are giving um people with a lot of different abilities or different understandings of belaying like instead of certifying them of saying they fit this exact mold, giving a little bit of leniency to say like, you don't have to fit this exact mold, but these are the standards that we have. Um, like the pillars that we've, we've made for, uh, the belay program is safety, consistency, professionalism. If you're following all three of those, um, and using kind of the techniques and the, um, yeah, technical safeguarding through that, you're able to, to create an environment where athletes are represented super well in their sport. Yeah. So I would say certification, I just think it's a, it's a thing on words. I I prefer endorsement because it gives a little bit more ability for people to have um, different technique or like different techniques or different styles for, for belaying. Yeah. I mean, I guess not everything needs like a whole, a whole process. 
Um, and have you ever done it at like an IFSC level or is it just like national level? Um, I have not traveled internationally for an IFSC event. I have worked, um, I have worked three internet or IFSC events. I worked uh, two para climbing world cups and then uh, youth world championships in Dallas in 2022. Awesome. Um, so what are some of like the differences between doing it at a local or national level versus IFSC level? Are there like more restrictions with IFSC or is it pretty much the same? We have standards that we try to at least represent in the regional scene to then work towards um, national and international levels. Um, technically with international events is um, you're supposed to use a tube style device or um, an ATC. So a non-assisted braking device is the standard for, for international events. And um, it's a huge conversational topic just because that's something that we have, we have to fight a lot is um, for us in a competition uh, climate to use a assisted braking device actually adds more issues and more concern for safety because especially with the the um, the styles of climbing that are happening on the international and national scene is very, very hard. Um, at any point that we're catching a fall using an assisted braking device, there's a lot more. We have less control. It's like driving a manual car. Like automatic, you... For like an automatic car, you're able to like press gas and press brake. So that's only so much control in terms of um, where you're positioning someone on the wall. So going back to the analogy is using a manual braking device or an ATC, you're able to say like, oh, there's a there is a head wall that we're trying to lower the climbers down into rather than them spiking into the wall. If you had an uh, assisted braking device, you have no control over that other than just adding more slack into the system, which is a 50-50 chance that it will actually engage um, correctly in that time. So that's more of the nuance of, yeah, you'll see us working at an IFSC event. Like very rarely will there be an exception made, especially for like when we've worked um, paraclimbing World Cups. We have a lot less margin to make catches safe um, for some of the athletes. And if we're using an assisted braking device, we have no control over that. I didn't know there was that much of a difference between using like an assisted one and like a regular ATC in terms of like the catches that you can do or I mean I thought it was both like for, like for both of them it was just you let out some more slack or less slack um so how does it make a difference like on the head wall example sure so I think going back to like just the the functions of both um how bullying works is you as a person on the ground are modulating friction to um, to stop the rope, and how you stop the rope is where um, you're able to control that. So using an assisted braking device, it locks the rope at the time that the catch happens. Using a, an ATC or a manual braking device, um, you're able to let friction go into the into the system instead of it just locking. So um, I always use this. It's hard to to like communicate it but as an as a visual example say that there's like an overhang here and there is a quick draw that's fixed kind of to the top of my hand if a climber were climbing above this and there is this amount of rope here if that climber were to fall so say a climber were on an overhang and they were above or run out from the clip and they were to fall in a situation where it's a locked rope it's just a straight circle if you were using a, an ATC, you're able to allow some friction or some rope into that system instead of it locking. And in, instead of making a perfect circular shape, you're making more of a parabola, um, which ends up contributing a lot less force to the climber and um, negates a lot of the horizontal force back into the wall. So it, it's it's hard to to verbally describe, but to to visually describe, it's like... Yeah, the difference between um, just like swinging super hard back into the wall 
Um, what we do in our uh, technical ability is we're able to use what is called dynamic rope control, where um, similar to rappelling, we're using your brake hand to um, add friction to the rope. Um, you're able to lessen some of the friction, but also lower, like slow the climber down. So instead of just like the rope going taut, the rope is feeding a little bit through the device and through the, the system so that the climber gets this like super smooth, like it doesn't feel like you're being caught. It feels like you're just, you're just done. Like, um, having my, <laughs> having my friends bel or like my belay friends belay me. It's just, it doesn't feel like you're, um, it doesn't feel like you're falling for forever. It just feels like you're naturally just stopping your route and then being lowered right after that. So instead of just the rope going taut and you slamming back into the wall. Yeah, I guess I've also, I think that's something I've heard before. I don't really know where, but that Blair's try to lower, like catch and kind of lower at the same time. Um, I thought I heard the reasoning was that uh, it's to like get through people quickly. Um, is that the case or is it, I mean, I'm sure half of it is also just like a soft catch, but is it also like you have to follow this timeliness factor? Sometimes, yeah. There are some event formats. You'll see a lot on like the uh, qualifying event regional and divisional scene in, here in the U.S. for youth or for quali uh, collegiate qualifying national events. You'll see like what they call a no earlier than time. So it's like they have this time that they're supposed to be here. If a route is running super long, say that like it's a slab route that's super technical that requires the climber to be there for their almost their entire climb time of six minutes but that no earlier than time is like a four minute margin you'll have a lot of um like if you're if they're climbing to six minutes and then you catch them and then you slowly lower them and then you have to pull the rope through you're adding like an additional minute or two um some sometimes in those instances um time is of the essence so like getting people down fast is helpful. Another thing is for competition climbing, they're not trying the route again. You're just going straight into lowering. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll perform a catch. In that catch, we'll do some lowering um, using dynamic rope control. We'll make sure that they have a safe stop and then we'll lower them to the ground, um, which is optically, it optically looks a lot safer than if they're just going straight from them falling to like their feet on the ground. Which used which used to sometimes be sometimes that happens the still. Yeah, sometimes there's not much you can do in terms of the margin that you have to work with. Like if a climber is calling for rope, like chicken clipping, you have to give it to them. You can't like in a competition format, you can't say like, no, I'm not going to give you this rope. I'm going to short rope you. It's like, no, they're asking for it. They could possibly make that clip, but if they don't make that clip, there's possibility that they're going to start heading down at a really quick rate and um yeah sometimes they'll they'll get their feet on the ground pretty quickly but often it's it's nothing too forceful and at least it shouldn't be like if it is that that's an issue on uh, on the belay or the belay team okay cool um and i think a lot of people probably wonder if you ever get paid to belay or in general, how you manage to make it out to all of these comps around the U.S. Because, um, I mean, flights and accommodation aren't cheap, so. Um, oftentimes, I do not get paid to be there. Um, as you work roles, like Head Belayer is the administrative and um, team lead role that happens in a lot of events. So the structure of it is, head belayer, assistant, belay uh, assistant head belayer, and below that is line belayers. Um, through national USA climbing events, um, working as head belayer, you get um, accommodations for travel, but uh, at the moment, we don't get paid. It's something that we do, um, especially for us on the national belay scene. Like A lot of the team is made up of people that just love the... There is kind of a thrill that comes with belaying, but just like the, the love and the, the craftsmanship of belaying that they they hone it to this ability that they're able to like, yeah, I want to I want to come out to this event. So, 
um, I've had the privilege to be able to go to a lot of events because um, either I've I've done an administrative role as head belayer um, as well as a working role as head belayer or um, as line belayers or people that are um, just belaying the event will get um, potential stipends for for belaying the event in terms of travel. So um, it is made cheaper through that, but it is not free most of the time. Well, it's good that a lot of people like you have the passion for belaying at least. <laughs> and I mean, you do sometimes get like a couple day passes for for volunteering. So there is that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be day passes at gyms that I will probably never go to again. Yeah, like I wonder in the like all of the systems in the nation that I've been to, like how many day passes I've accrued. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you can maybe go back one day. Maybe. But yeah, going into I guess like the logistics again of bullying. Um, I guess maybe can you like walk me through the process you go through from when you get to the comp to when you're ready to belay like the first climber? Yeah. Um, I will do this from the perspective of a head belayer. I recently did a divisional event this last weekend, so that's kind of fresh on my mind. Um, yeah, as head belayer, it's, there's actually a lot of preparation that happens um, for national events and for divisional and regional events. You'll have um, more than a month of time to prepare for national calls like it's important to have the head belayer attend those meetings because they go over all of the logistics there. Um, they're very familiar of how the rounds will go. And it's helpful to then decide the team that you need. So um, like, yeah, there's a lot of different needs for different events. Oftentimes you'll see a, um, like a flash format for, for lead for the qualification days. And there's often two routes for that. Um, sometimes there's three, and sometimes it's red point modified, which not to go too in depth of like what those mean, but for flash format, it's climbers have the ability to watch a route preview and then um, climb the route and then go to their next route after uh, ample rest time. Um, so finding out the format of each round, is there qualifications semifinals and then finals round um and then checking with gyms um so a lot of the time when we're working with national events uh usa climbing will will take the liability of um of the safety just using the the skill that they have or like the skill that's deployed through the belay team um a lot of gyms in the nation are assisted breaking device mandated so say like the front in salt lake city or um mesa rim in texas or california um you'll see a lot of gyms or commercial gyms go towards this uh abd mandate um for us in our profession and our skill we'll we'll actually be able to use an atc or a, a tube style device instead um, so communicating that first off, because that's where we have like professional catches. That's where we have like the most safe catches. Um, we'll communicate that. And then after that is uh, tracking ropes and systems. So that's a lot of pre-event planning is format, um, devices, and then ropes. And then after that is forming a team, which... Um, we have a, a pretty robust belay roster as of now. When I started the belay roster, I don't think existed. There was maybe some names on a sheet, but now it's like, now it's like more than 150 names of people that have been vetted, um, to, to be able to be deployed for events, either in their local scene or for national events. Um, so there's five levels similar to route setting or to judging that people are able to to either be vetted by a by a l4 or higher um to then be a part of that so creating the belay team is really helpful or is the next step of the process which takes a lot of um yeah a lot of coordination of okay 
who is going to be in this area or who lives in this area that we can readily call on? Who has given them endorsement? What can we know about their belay technique? Um, and then after that is, if there's no one else local that we wanted to deploy, who are we going to deploy from other regions or other uh, parts of the nation to to be a part of this event? And I think one thing that I really appreciate with the National Belay Coordination is um, we've done really well to to make it equitable instead of just like back in the day, bef- way before I was a part of it, it was an old boys club of just like, oh, we know Joe Schmo, he can be a part of the team because he's our friend. Um, and now it's like, it's not necessarily a group of friends. Yeah, we do have friends that are a part of the scene, but um, it's just uh, a lot of people that are passionate about belaying that can be a part of it. And I think like one of the things that I see a lot and I really appreciate is seeing a lot of women on the belay teams um, as as the program has developed, it's been less and less just like guys belaying guys and girls belaying girls or just uh, whatever gender for whatever gender categories. It's like everyone can belay everyone with the skill. They're like when they have the appropriate skill. So I think that's been reasonable. Something that I'm hoping to see in this next or in the 2025 season is a um, either an all women belay team or a, a women led belay team because I think that's cool. I don't know. I don't see that often in like a skilled climbing group. A lot of it is like, yeah, you'll see lots of men on the scene, which is not my biggest, that's not my favorite thing, but um, to see a lot of just like cultures, identities represented um, through the volunteers of Belayers is awesome. I think it's super cool. I guess those are the logistics before the comp. Um, when you're getting ready to belay the first climber, uh, I guess what goes into preparing for the climber? Yeah, we usually will all meet up. We'll have a belay team meeting um, prior to the round or prior to the event, just saying like, this is the importance of this round. This is the people that are here. This is the skill that's represented from the belay crew, but also this is the playing field that we're working with. So like national team trials, the needs are different than um, like collegiate nationals. Um, The skill at team trials is the best of the best. Collegiate nationals will have the best of the best for the most part. And also like people that are still really new to the scene. Um, The collegiate series um, is getting more and more traction as climbing as sport has become more popular. So, um, yeah, like the needs of those are very different of for collegiate nationals. You need a lot of skill of people that are still really new to lead climbing to people that are like the best. So that's a, that's the thing on the route setters to, to create separation through the routes themselves, but also, um, make them safe. So you'll see it's a lot easier to clip one and two um, than it oh, is to clip okay, yeah, the sense. first draw at national team trials. So, I mean, I would think that they would make it like easier for like national team trials or even like internationally too, just cause I don't know <laughs> why not. Yeah. I mean, well, the, the belay skill of the U S has grown so much to the point where like, Route setters can rely on us to provide to provide safety, even through like a sketchy sequence off the deck, um, which we did see at the semifinals at national team trials. Where like there's a um, there's an Instagram post on our our Instagram USA Belay of like me and Toby Monroe. Um, we were working the semifinals route. And there were. Um, there were a lot of climbers above first draw that fell. And it was it was like a it was a very physically challenging and demanding sequence, just like right off the deck. But that's because they knew like the route setters knew that we could perform to that ability. So I understand like, yeah, a clip one and two could be easy, but um the the route setters of USA climbing know um what what we can provide for them. And also the athletes are in this place. They know that they can rely on us to keep them safe. So that like athlete belayer connection through the last few years, we're able to represent like, Hey, 
we'll keep you safe. You've never seen me before. You can trust me. Yeah, I'll try to find that video and link it so that uh, I can watch it and so everyone else can watch it. But okay, that's good to know. Yeah, so we we had a belay team meeting. We go over right, yes. like the the field of athletes that are going to be there, the field of play, the round. Um, so kind of recapping like all of the introduction stuff that we did over like a planning call, and then um, yeah, when the round starts, it's just like okay, great. Uh, we'll have these people assigned to this route. These people assigned to this route. We usually have two per route, depending on how many people are able to make it. Um, And then, yeah, we just keep going. Uh, So it'll start with like at tie-in for like a non-isolation format. It's just people will just review that their knot looks good. We look at a figure eight follow-through with a stopper knot. We look at their harness to make sure it's double backed and then it's on appropriately. We'll look at their leg loops. So we'll do a quick, what we call the belayer's blessing. We'll say your knot looks good, your harness looks good. Just mm, as like a quick, okay. especially for people that don't speak English as their first language to be oh, able to represent true. like, okay, this is your knot. This is what I'm looking at. This is your harness. This is what I'm looking at. You look good. So we'll, we'll visually demonstrate like with the arm going down, not arm going to the side, your harness looks good. So our belayer's blessing, we'll look at that and then we'll show our side. <laughs> um, so it's, it's just a buddy check that we facilitate of your stuff looks good. This is my belay device inside making sure that it's locked, always showing that there's an audible click. Um, Because, yeah, you want to represent that as you're going off to then belay them on the route. That, yeah, I'm here. I'm making sure that the safety is correct. Yeah. So, yeah, they'll they'll start climbing. We'll catch them. Once we've caught them, we'll lower them pretty quickly. And then we'll detach from the system, tell them, go see your judges, and then... We'll rinse or repeat up to a hundred times. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, and I think this was also, uh, it also came from like a Discord question. Um, do the athletes have any options when it comes to who belays them or is it just like randomly assigned? Yeah. So no, the question or the answer to that is no. Um, the athletes have no choice in who belays them. And the reason for that is for fairness. Um, like, um, and for us on the, the administrative side is we want to make sure that there's fairness for the for the athletes themselves. We have a lot of skills and techniques that we've developed that every single person is having a consistent experience. I guess, like, how does it provide an advantage other than, I guess, just like being like just knowing each other and maybe feeling comfortable in that way? Are there like other advantages that you could get from using the same belayer? Yeah, I would say like it's someone you know how they're going to operate. So you have a lot less unknown. Yeah, we won't we won't let climbers have choice in their belayers. We will appropriately deploy belayers to be on um, on specified routes. And the reason for that is um, we don't want to show in, in like we don't want to show preference to other climbers. If we say like, oh, we're going to have this amazing belayer, just belay this one athlete, that athlete is probably going to perform better. Um, Just due to like them knowing this person. But um, the reason why we've worked really hard on the belay scene in terms of endorsement is um, at any point, if you are an athlete, you should feel confidence to climb as hard as physically possible. And like forget that there's a belayer on the other side because they have so much skill. So that's one of the that's one of the um, like real big driving factors to uh, this coordination or this USA climbing uh, belay program that we've created is that at any point that a a climber is on the wall, they should they should have the um, they should have the right to perform as hard as possible instead of feeling scared that their belayer on the other end is like not performing very well to the point where they're like possibly short roped or just like I'm scared I don't know who this person is I don't know if they're going to catch me we want to take that take that fear away from them through just showing that we have the optics of we're providing safe catches at any point 
we are doing safety checks at every moment, like non-negotiable. And then um, also just presenting ourselves professionally. Like you'll see us on the the national scene wearing dark pants and a black shirt because it represents a like, hey, we we dressed up for this occasion. Like we work hard for to be here and we're working hard uh, for you to have a good competition. Well, so how often do belayers make... I guess I wouldn't say like silly mistakes, but, um, or not like beginner mistakes, but just like mistakes like short roping or something like that when a competition is happening. On the national scene, no. On the divisional and regional scene, you'll possibly see it, but like for the, the standard that we set for USA climbing is like you will have the best of the best belaying you. Um, um, like I, in my career, belay career, I haven't seen anyone be short roped. I haven't short roped anyone nationally. Um, I don't think, I mean, I don't think I've short roped anyone. No one has called me out on it, but like, yeah, people will start to get like, they'll start to zone a little bit or zone out um, where you'll just see like their focus is not a hundred percent. Oftentimes on the belay or the head belayer side, I'll say like, Hey, I'll sub in for you. Like go take a quick water break. Um, and what you'll see is just people kind of not fully paying attention to their climber or, um, just like, yeah, you'll, I don't know. You'll just kind of zone out cause it's just like re- repetitive sometimes. Um, I think that's the mistake, the mistake that you'll see often is just like a little bit of complacency or just a little bit of like not full focus on the climber, but oftentimes we'll correct that very quickly of like, Hey, you look like you need to go just like get a quick bite to eat or get a quick snack. This has been a super long round. Also been for you, uh, just to give, just to give the, the belayer some time to rest. All okay. right. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so for, if you're like familiar with the athletes or, you know, sort of their climbing style, do you ever have things in mind on like how to modify for that athlete? Like, if a certain climber climbs really fast or maybe takes really big risks or always tries like weird beta breaks or something like that? If I know a, an athlete or a climber, I will go through the same exact script every single time. Even if they like talk to me, like I'll, I'll try to keep conversation to a minimum of like, hey, this is great music that's playing or something not a part of the competition yeah i'll engage with for a little bit but i always will go like you'll you'll hear me say my name is noah i i will belay you today your knot looks good your harness looks good this is my harness and device you're locked we're gonna get out to the field of play blah 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 blah. i will do that for every single athlete regardless if i have known them for years or if i had just met them and the reason for that is for consistency and professionalism because um say you're a climber sitting on deck and you hear like a belayer saying like, oh, hey, blah, 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 blah. Like, how's your mom? How's your dad? How's your family? Um, if you're that climber on deck, you'd be like, I have nothing in common with this belayer. As an example, this is not something that I've experienced, hopefully not. But um, yeah, even if I have seen them after the round, possibly I'll talk to them. But in the middle of a round, it's like, no, I'm on. I have my game face. I'm not going to uh, participate in that even if I've known them for <laughs> belayed them for like every round and every event for the past like season it's like no it's the same experience every single time I'm belaying you after the fact sure we can talk but um yeah so that's the first part the second part um in terms of like modifying belay or technique not necessarily there will be more, there'll be some athletes or climbers that I'll know. Okay. I know they, they will like throw rope up or they're asked for rope super quickly. I have to be prepared for that. So yeah, I can, I can modify my, my belay, just like ability of, oh, I have situational awareness that this person looks like they're going to fall, but they're actually not going to fall. Or, um, this person is chainsawing rope and I just have to like chuck rope at them. And then they take big risks. I have to provide a soft catch or a safe catch for them. Um, yeah. There'll be some athletes that like, I 
see <laughs> there's one athlete that I um, have bullied for a handful of times and this athlete will often ask um hey I'm gonna do a jump start <laughs> so <laughs> like almost every time um yeah I won't name names because I don't think it's my place to say it but <laughs> this athlete will always say hey I'm gonna jump start this and I'll say okay I'll belay you which I think is so funny but yeah it's there are some things to prepare for but oftentimes it's the skill that we have is we just we're prepared for anything uh we're prepared for any sort of athlete we're prepared for any weight difference between us and an athlete um if, if they're lighter or heavier like that's where that's where like the the advanced belay skill goes is how do you provide the same exact catch for every athlete but also yeah remain professional yeah, well, it's good to hear that you kind of keep things consistent in that way. I do feel like if I were an athlete who like saw someone who had like great rapport with the belayer ahead of me, I would feel it would kind of like get in my head that may, I don't know, it would just be weird and like put me in a weird space, I feel like. So that makes a lot of sense. It's like almost... I don't know, like a weird social game that's added to it. Yeah. I mean, that's a big part of of us on the national belay side is head game is what we want to preserve for athletes. Like we don't want to get into any athlete's head of like, I'm not good enough for this route or blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, we're here to support you as a belayer. We're here to like if they've seen us in previous rounds, they've seen that we've caught really safely. We have um, this belay skill. Um, so we typically use optics as a metric uh, for for like any evaluation. If you look safe and you are safe, like you're representing the belay program super well, where an athlete, like they can see you or a parent can see you and see, oh, they're making sure my athlete doesn't fall to the ground like yes that is the baseline um but after that it's okay they're providing soft catches or safe catches um for every athlete and then when it gets to that tie-in point it's like hopefully there's enough situation or just like um integrity in that situation that this climber can now know okay they've seen me belay without me having to say anything they've seen me belay hopefully they have um enough like they have enough ability to then perform as as hard as possible on a like a 514 climb that they're about to get on. Please excuse this brief intermission, but I've gotten a few requests for this, so I just wanted to announce that if you're interested in helping support the show, my Patreon page is now live. Some perks include ad-free, interruption-free episodes, deleted scenes, prioritized guest questions, or the ability to submit video questions, an enamel pin shipped to you after two months of membership, and much more to come. The proceeds go back into the podcast podcast to help me break even and they help improve the experience of the guests if you'd like to support the podcast non-monetarily liking commenting and sharing helps a great deal as well back to the show quick logistical question that uh, came to mind um you guys don't wear those like belay glasses (laughs) um is that like an aesthetic thing or like wouldn't it help with i don't know your neck or something like that (laughs) That's a great question. Um, So we prefer not to use bully glasses. A lot of that has to do with um, like when we're working on a field where there's more than one climb, which is every field that's not, or every round that's not finals. um, Like seeing the field of play or having as big a field of vision as possible is so helpful. Um, Like when I'm looking at a climber and I'm using bully glasses, I only see like, like a three quarters of their body um, rather than if I'm not using belay glasses, I see their whole body and then, or for the most part, like I'll see them climbing. And then I can also see if there's a route that's like three draws next to me, I can see where that climber is, where they're moving. If they're like being caught and their body is coming towards me, like I can move out of the way. When you have belay glasses you are restricting not only the vision that you have on the climber but you also restrict the vision right in front of you 
and kind of to the sides. So, I mean, what we'll mitigate with that is just we do belay stretches. <laughs> we stretch oh, really? Um, oh, yeah. actually. Yeah. Not like super formalized, but like before and after every round, like make sure that you're working your neck that because oftentimes you're just staring straight up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's there's little things like sometimes I'll I'll turn my body so I look to them sideways. So I'm not like using just direct neck on that. So oh. there are ways to 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 minimize the pain that you'll have. Uh, I had some I had some pretty serious pain for the collegiate uh nationals qualifying round was like I it was a long, long, long round of I it was close it was maybe more than a hundred catches per person. I'm not I can't remember the exactly, but like it was staring up and it was vert instead of overhang, which like gives you a little bit of like respite on your neck but yeah it was just vert for hours it was like i think nine to four or five or something i don't remember exactly but it was a lot of looking up (laughs) but yeah stretches are so good stretches feel great yeah i might need to get some stretches from you because i like had a neck injury and then it kind of like came back again and just like looking up is kind of (laughs) hard So yep. I noticed that when I was doing like a little bit of belaying and then I was like, oh, I don't know how people do this for any longer than a session. I will say belay glasses are not like I don't hate them. I do think they're helpful, especially if someone's projecting. But in a competition, I don't use them. But yeah, hopefully your neck feels better. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll send you some stretches. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> You're um, welcome. But OK, good to know. I just I had to know. Um, okay, and so what are some of the differences between belaying for, uh, I guess, like different categories of climbers, like youths versus, um, I guess, like elite climbers versus paraclimbers? Yeah, I'll start with youth. Um, a lot of it is like there's a lot of there's a lot of categories. So it, um, on the the regional scene, I think it goes all the way to to D categories. Um, so there's D, C, B, A, and junior. So there's five age categories and then there's two gender categories. So there's 10 categories that we belay for. Um, with with lead climbing, if you're using an assisted braking device, which a lot of the gyms near me are assisted braking device mandated, um, catches are really really finicky because you're using an assisted braking device there's often a weight difference between you as the belayer and the athlete you're belaying for so like the weight difference between me and the average um like youth b climber is great i will weigh a lot more than them um and using an assisted braking device is more often, like if I don't jump or I don't modulate my gravity for that for that climber, they're going to have a lot of forces enacted on them, and that could be forces back into the wall just through the rope itself. Um, so what I often will do in the youth scene is, um, if it's an assist braking device mandated gym, it's like I will use a specific device or I just will jump a lot. So there's a lot of t- technique that you'll need to provide really safe catches for for the youth series when using an assisted braking or when using an atc or a manual braking device you can use friction in the system rather than like jumping so oftentimes you'll see on an elite side is we won't leave the ground like that's one of our big goals is we'll stay on the ground and we'll 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 modify the friction so that the climber is being slowed down rather than being spiked into the wall um and it doesn't look too different on the elite scene because there is a lot of difference in climbers' physique. Not to go too in depth with that, but um, like you could have very similar parameters in terms of um, which category you're bullying for. The skill will be different um, for like an NACS or a National American Cup Series event. Um, you'll have a lot of different skill levels uh, represented for open nationals or Yeti or elite national championships. You'll see a little bit more. Um, you'll see more tenured climbers, and then 
for national team trials. You'll have the best of the best. Um, and then going into paraclimbing, uh, which I find to be the, like, those are my favorite events to belay for. Really? It's the best. It's such a good climbing scene because of just like, I don't know, diversity of physical ability and um, just diversity of people there. National team trials, like, uh, so the last national team trials, um, the national paraclimbing championships was also at the same time, like just the week after. Similar thing happened last year at uh, Mesa Rim in Austin. Um, you'll you'll see like national team trials and then the paraclimbing national championships. The scene shifts right as the the paraclimbing event begins, and it's just so like beautiful and fun and loving and like uh, yeah, so such good energy. Um, national team trials is great and fun and like it's it's fun energy in terms of like it's a comp. Um, but it's a little bit stuck up because it's like, yeah, it's the best of the best. These are people that have like made this their career. Um, and not that paraclimbers haven't, but, uh, the people that are represented in paraclimbing is like, I don't know, people that are in love with the sport to the point that they're here to connect with people of similar, um, like they're all, yeah, we're all just like represented very well by just really hardworking athletes. So I think pair so much fun. Um, so, yeah. And then playing for those events is um, there's a lot of care that's needed. A lot of the people that will sign up for the pair climbing belay teams, you'll see both people that have very little competition experience that just love the scene. And then you'll have people that love, like have a lot of pair climbing experience and also just love the scene. So it's, um, so there's a lot to, to factor into that because there are a lot of categories for, um, for para, I believe there's off the top of my head, there's like, I think 11, 10 or 11 categories and then gender categories added to that. Um, so there's, there's a lot of classifications. Yeah. Do you have to like belay differently for each type of classification? Like blind versus um rp versus uh like amputee categories possibly yeah there's there's parts of it that you'll have to like have different ways that you catch uh mm. the feedback that we've received um from previous events is uh e category climbers prefer not to have like a super soft and like graceful fall they would rather just be caught so they can feel that the rope is catching them rather than like um, for a lot of the catches that we perform it, they are somewhat senseless of like, you're just kind of coming into a cloud of softness. Uh, B category climbers don't necessarily love that, which uh, we try our hardest to advocate for them to give them a, like not a terrifying experience. So okay. um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So B category um, will look a lot different in terms of like the, the timing of how they will come out and um for yeah one of the big differences for seated climbers for the seated category of um athletes that don't um have the like control of their their lower extremities they climb so fast they're they're campus climbing um so we have two belayers per position um after this we'll go into tandem belays but you'll have um you'll have a very similar belay to a speed climber uh, or like back in the day before auto belays, they would have two uh, two belayers, one on the top side of the ATC or belay device and one on the bottom brake side. Um, oh, I never to just even pull thought that about rope. that. For yeah, speed. to pull that rope through. Well, we, did, we didn't We did um, think about that. Like my first paraclimbing World Cup that I worked, it was, I was belaying and I was belaying this athlete who is amazing. He, yeah. He crushed, he campus the whole route. I was the only belayer. I was P busing because P busing is the standard that we use um, as fast as physically possible. And I could not keep up with his speed. And it was after that that we're like, okay, optically, this looks terrible because the, the rope is like, there's so much slack in the system. Um, the head belayer for the event, my friend Ty, 
uh, like just pulled on the the top side. I pulled on the brake side very quickly, and then I went into just a standard like taking out slack. And <laughs> that's where we then corrected. That's like okay for seated climbers, we need. For if it's a tandem blade, we need four belayers for this one athlete. Um, so that's what that's what we do now, which I think is very really? great. Okay. Um, so those are the two. I would say those are the two extremes that we see of like this ath- this category needs this and this category needs this. Yeah. So seated climbers they climb very fast, which is so fun to watch. But also sometimes I would say that's probably been the most stressful mo- moments for me in blaying is like. Just not being able to keep up with a insanely strong seated climber. Yeah, and so I guess like the tandem belaying process. Do you want to go into how that works? Yeah. So um, something that's implemented into pair climbing for overhung routes is a tandem belay, and the purpose of that is it's not. It is a cumbersome uh, belay technique for the climber because. Like there's more rope than you want, but if you were to imagine a severely overhung route, which some of these athletes are climbing in an indoor space, um, if you had just an anchor point at the top of the wall and they were to fall like low down on that overhang, they're going to hit the mat very hard. Um, just in terms of just the physics of it, if it's just a straight circle arc, they're coming back to the to the ground. Um, with a with a tandem belay, there's a redirect low down. So there's two top ropes, one at the very top of the wall, one about like a third or halfway up the wall that will redirect the the um, the catch process. So um, as the climber is low down, that first or lower belayer, we call that the primary belayer, will be the first one to catch. Say that climber lo- uh, falls down low. And then as they climb above that that lower top rope point, um, then the secondary belayer, which is on the very top of the wall, will start taking over uh, in terms of then performing the catch. So you'll see, like, you'll see the primary belayer kind of giving out slack as the climber goes up, and then the the whole entire time the secondary belayer is taking all the slack out. So um, the reason for that is not to make a very challenging uh system for the climbers but to give them the ability to climb something that's very overhung without uh the risk of safety so tandem belays are not ideal but they do give a lot different terrain for the athletes to climb yeah that was really interesting um makes sense that there's a lot of differences that pop up for paraclimbing so that was good to know um okay i think those are all like the logistical questions i had uh so i kind of want to go into some like maybe more like story-based questions or like questions about how you how you are like actually feeling while you're belaying um so do you ever feel like nervous or pressure when you're belaying um if you're ever like worried that you'd somehow mess something up or is it just so second nature that that's just never even occurred to you um it has definitely occurred to me um, okay. i will say it doesn't happen often i think when i first started there is stressors from uh what you'll see like because qualification rounds almost are never broadcast um and then semifinals and finals are broadcast um so different rounds have different levels of stress for me sometimes of like okay um when i'm belaying for a qualifier round it's like everyone is watching in the facility no one else is watching externally but um i think i get a lot of fear in the qualification round because it's like that's what's setting the example for the for the rest of the event is like we're belaying well for this event this is how we do it but like starting with that first climber so it's always like the first climber has like a little bit of like do I remember how to do this? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Which I do. I do remember how to do this um, oftentimes. So you'll like, I don't know if this is a universal feeling, but the more times that I've done it, I have a lot less stress or fear. So I, I can get nervous. I can get a little bit scared, but like overall, like I can go to any route on any round and be like, Oh, I can believe this. Like I've had, I have enough like glossary of, 
catch things or like people that I've caught in my in my memory that I'm able to say like this is what I did this is what I did or this is how I modulate um, just friction for for this style of climber or this style of catch so I at this point no my first nationals event yes I remember just like there were four routes and for nationals teams you usually have two routes per or two belayers per route so you'll have like a team of eight we had a team of four <laughs> and it was my first nationals event and there was I think there was like 60 climbers per gender category about on average. Um, so my first nationals event, I'm belaying 60 times in a row oh. and like, I can't get critique or anything really from any belayer like elsewhere because they're actively belaying the routes and it just was like going through it real fast. So that whole qualification round was like nerve wracking. Cause I was still trying to like, showcase yeah i have ability but also like a lot of people are watching and then semifinals round semifinals round like it's on youtube and you can just see how janky i look <laughs> like i was still i was still perfecting my my abilities but yeah uh there's the the national american cup series uh stop in albuquerque new mexico i <laughs> was i was new to the scene and like there was still a lot of like belay techniques that were not like written down or like implemented super well or just like made into a glossary. So it just was like we didn't know how to describe like okay he isn't doing this this and this. Um, was just like okay he's he's new to the scene he looks janky. <laughs> okay. Um, so I over time built my technique. I yeah that first event super nervous and then did you like watch back to see yourself like belaying on the video uh i have because um at a climbing gym that i worked at we would put just like climbing videos on and sometimes they would just be like usa climbing videos <laughs> and oh, I'll sure, see, like, yeah. oh there i am oh, like okay, i was nice. there i remember yeah. that so um and also sometimes it is helpful to look back at previous catches of like, I know what went well. Like I know what I could have done differently or like this one is great. I actually really liked this catch. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that's the only reason why it's like, you can still perform a lot of analysis. of like, this is what went well. This was, what did it go well? And sometimes I will watch climbing video or like I will watch events for the belaying more so than the climbers. I just like, wow this this federation has a lot of good skill or this federation needs some work what's something as viewers we should like watch when it comes to belayers to watch i i think the catch like you can make catches look really good and really safe and if you're like just one of the cool things is like if you do a catch super well and they run out on an overhang usually they'll swing but if they don't swing like that's good on the belayer to take into account like the physics of everything. And then you'll just see them like, Oh, they went into space and they're down on the ground very safely and they showed a stop. So for like the average viewer, it's, I don't know, maybe. Yeah. What I look for is just like safety of making sure that they're not like being slammed into the wall. But if they're giving like soft catches, I, I think is great. Another thing for the YouTube comments to complain about if they notice a hard catch, I guess. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, previously when you, um, like before the competitors come out, you say the same thing to them every time. Um, are there ever any competitors who are like nervous and they want to like talk before they climb or... Um, are most of them just like in the zone and trying to keep focused? Uh, it depends. Um, one of my, fr the first nationals event that I did in New Mexico, <laughs> uh, during the finals round, uh, my friend Steve was there too. Um, we were sitting down, we were in ISO, we were sitting down, or the climber was sitting down. I was in, uh, in the system, like with my boy stuff. And the climber just said, who are you? <laughs> I was what? like, uh, I'm, I'm Noah. I, and she's like, where do you live? Like Colorado Springs? She's like, okay. And then my friend Steve was like, he's good. You can trust him. It's like, okay, cool. <laughs> but it just was a funny, like, 
question that I didn't know how to answer. Like, I I actually don't really know what I'm doing here. Like, I'm just playing. It, it's a valid question, though, especially if you're on the national scene. You're like, who? I have not seen this guy before. Oh, sure. Okay. Ask like away. they were like, familiar with the other players. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes, they were. They were not familiar with me. But um, yeah, to go back to the question, um, yeah, there you'll see some nervousness. Um, if it's someone that's familiar, like I'll go through the whole spiel of you're not good. Your harness looks good. The whole like quick buddy check logistics thing. But if they talk, like, I'll try to keep talking to a minimum, but I can tell, like, oh, they're just nervous and they're trying to, like, communicate about the route. Like, you'll see that on the youth scene a lot with different categories. Like, nervousness is real, especially if you are a child. So I don't want to I don't want to take that away from them by just ignoring them. So I'll just I'll engage partially in small talk. I don't have any other than that one conversation with that one climber during finals. I don't really have much that I that I will hear sometimes like people will be sn- or climbers will be snarky. I'll be like, hi, I'm Noah. I'll belay you today. And they'll say, hi, I'm so-and-so and I'll climb for you today. Okay. I think that's funny. I think uh-huh. that's funny every single time. <laughs> yeah. Other than that, not conversations, pretty minimal. Okay. Other stories. Um, are there any bad falls that you've seen? Um, I think in the discord, someone had posted like a video once, from a lead japan cup where an athlete's shoe got clipped into a clip and she got stuck there i yeah i did see that on the discord um i've experienced something similar actually not necessarily someone's shoe but um during a round of the youth uh world championships in dallas There was a climber that was climbing up in just the position of the quick draw and um, just the movement of the climber's leg snared their leg. So, like, they were dangling just from, like, the rope being wrapped around their leg. And I was belaying actively, and, like, I had slack in the system, and I was trying to just, like, demonstrate to, like, the audience that saw me, like, hey, I'm not holding this climber up. It's the leg that's their leg that's snared on the rope itself um and they didn't speak english so um i couldn't communicate anything we like were trying to get setters like setters please please help um and then the coach went out into the field of play which um in the moment is great like the coach went out to the field of play described what to do to the athlete like the athlete went in direct to their harness and then i provided slack they unsnared their leg they went or they unclipped the draw from their harness and then I caught them. Um, that was a weird moment where it just was like, uh, I will stay on belay. I'm not going to detach from the system, but I'm just standing here waiting for whatever to happen. But yeah, that would, that would be one of the like more surprising moments that I've had. Is there like video of that anywhere? There is, yeah. Um, I think it's a it's a live stream or like a finals feed for or semifinals feed for youth world championships. But yeah, I felt bad for the climber of just like, yeah, you're at a youth world and then your leg gets smeared. But it happened again that season, which was interesting to another climber um in Edinburgh, I think. Mm, okay. I'll try to find the videos. Yeah. So those are things that have happened or like that's an experience that I've had. Um, other than that, like, thankfully you won't see people deck. Like, I personally haven't seen it. I've seen people, what we will sometimes call soft deck. Like, there is padding on the floor for a reason, which is very helpful. But um, there are some, some situations and some, like, physics equations where there's only, that's all that can happen. Um, I know I got some hate comments on a, a reel that we posted on the belay the usa belay of like a climber was above first draw like decently so and then um uh like touched the ground and you could tell that they weren't injured like i still assisted the catch but the the way that the rope was or the way that i was positioned and the climber was positioned is like i was in the corner of the wall i couldn't take out slack like super fast um the climber just like 
their their body was on the ground um or like their legs touched the ground but they like i still partially caught their fall so that's often what you'll see um yeah i don't i don't know i don't see that happen too often not to say that it hasn't happened i think belay or i mean climbing is inherently dangerous you'll always see just risk involved but um in my personal experience i haven't seen much in terms of like anyone being severely injured thankfully i'm very grateful for that um but it at any point it still could happen um what do you do when it's like before the second clip and it's like a little bit dangerous like how do you mitigate uh the risk there um it's just a a sense of always knowing like if i could catch someone at that moment so between one and two is always just like you're locked in you're so locked in to just like no matter what catch i want to keep them like either i want to bring them softly to the ground or i just want to like make sure they're not touching the ground so thinking of okay what is am i going to run back what is my escape plan how do i how do i get out of the way of the climber because oftentimes like the rope will be close to their legs we want to make sure that we're not flossing a climber or um like giving them severe rope burn so oftentimes it's like we want to be out of the way if they're at the first draw and they're clipped in the first draw going to second um they're often in a situation where it might be safer for them to come to the ground and like similar to a boulder fall rather than like on on the competition scene we don't spot because we would rather one injured person rather than two and it's it's easier for us to to follow that if we don't spot the climber so that that's something you'll see between one and two it's just it's just control it's just knowing the knowing your route that you're bullying of like okay this is the physics of what could happen this is what i can do as like a escape plan or just like a catch plan so that's that's what goes through my mind and then after two it's just like okay cool just make your clips and you'll you'll be fine good to know how do you i guess get selected for like an international event the only person that has really done it for usa climbing is ty hardaway he was um he was on the the belay team for for the world championships in Bern. so he is yeah he is like the he was the national belay coordinator for usa climbing until like just this last week or so um has now turned to toby monroe but ty hardaway is like the pioneer for a lot of um a lot of just documentation but also coordination of a lot of the nation's belayers and then uh yeah he worked an event in in Bern, which is very cool and then he's hopefully going to do some work it his he's now working towards developing um a international program for for all of the federations to kind of align to similar standards we've seen a lot of success in in usa climbing's belay program to the point where the ifsc is considering yeah let's try to implement similar like like how we are represented by multiple regions the international federation of sport climbing is represented by multiple federations so how do we how can we kind of align both of those values um ty is doing a really good job with um spearheading that so we'll see a lot of um we'll hopefully see a lot more of him internationally he is yeah it's exciting to see just because he has a lot of a lot of history and a lot of background like he's he's one of the people that have really brought me up in um usa climbing to this point where it's like okay cool he's now working internationally and developing what is called world belay um instead of usa belay it's like it's an international thing um yeah with the priorities of skills ethics and culture so he would be a cool person to also talk to in terms of um he has full scoop of the history but also just the the development of the program um yeah ty is super cool so shout out to him i know he's gonna listen to this so Oh, nice. Okay. Well, so to get 
onto like the international scene? Is it also just a sign of genius? <laughs> Or is there like a is there a full process for that, or is it just like you got to know the right people? I think for it depends per federation. I think it's more who you know or just like the experience that you've had. So it's similar, maybe not as structured as USA climbing. Um, of just like oh, we've had this person that's belayed for this like local event. We can endorse them to maybe uh, work this event. So, um. Yeah, he worked burn. I think it was just like a USA Climbing IFSC like job or just like a development thing for Belay. Because uh, he also, he was the, um, I think he was the head belayer for the Para World Championship. Um, or yeah, he conducted the, uh, he co-head belayed and he conducted a belay clinic for uh, the Para Climbing World Championship in Bern. So that's why he was there was to v- develop the paraclimbing scene, which is also really cool because now there's more uh, possibility of it being in the Olympics for LA 2028, which is so exciting and so incredible. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what other region, uh, other federations have. I think it's more just like you have tenure or you have ability from this federation that we find you able enough um, and there's possibility that it might be sign up genius. Awesome. Um, well, I think those are all the questions I had. So we'll get into some of the discord questions. Uh, first one, what are some common bad practices that you have to point out and make people stop doing when they're belaying? Most common bad practice that I see is a uh, poor break hand technique. So I, um, work towards the industry standard of using PBUS, which means if you're unfamiliar, uh, pull, break, under, and slide. And the reason for that is at any point you have a fixed point as you're sliding your hand. So it adds redundancy to the system. You'll see people, and I sometimes am not the best at this, but we'll call it slip, slap, slop in our area, where it's just like a quick, like you'll bring your break hand up and then um, you'll like, hook your pinky finger around the rope and then you'll slide it back down. Um, it's a very old school alpine belay. Um, you'll see that. And then uh, another, yeah, so you'll see, I see a lot of poor break hand control. A lot of p- people have been using the the term tunneling, which is very specific to using a grigri. I personally don't like it because I don't find it very redundant or safe. Um, so I personally use PBUS for anything and then people will use tunneling for using an ATC. At any point that you are tunneling your hand up and someone were to fall, there's a lot less ability for you to use friction on that hand to then stop the climber and you'll probably get, give yourself severe rope burn Is tunneling just when you like let out slack and you're just, I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. Um, What is tunneling? So the term I've heard, the term came from a hard is easy video of like this belay technique, but it's like you have, you take out the rope. So you're using both your guide hand and your brake hand and you're going into a, like you're pulling slack out of the system position. And then instead of taking your, your, non-dominant or your guide hand and bringing it under and then sliding your brake hand up you just slide your brake hand up oh, which okay. gotcha. I don't find very safe because like I said at any point that someone were to fall in that instance um, if a Grigory were to fail for whatever reason like you there's possibility that someone could deck from that so that's something that I see a lot I don't love um, so just P buses industry standard it is a little bit slower but it is the safest technique that i use um so i will usually take or I, I will usually correct people on that if if they have poor um, break hand usage and then um yeah for for catching people won't put two hands on the lowering side which i have recently cha- transitioned into doing and said i was just like be sloppy and have one hand on the brake side but putting both hands on the brake side is safe as you catch someone um is the safest way to to do it so that's another thing um and then 
yeah, just like position of yourself versus the climber. Some people will stand right under a climber climbing and if they were to fall, they would fall on top of you. Sometimes, like it's things that you you won't initially think about, but then when you like think about, oh, if they were to fall right now, oh, they would be right on top of me. I'm going to move over this way. So body position is huge. So given these uh, practices, do you feel like you're more cautious when you're the climber and you like care a lot about who your belayer is? I think so. Um, I would love to see someone belay before you let them belay me. Um, just because I want to see like, okay, how safe does their belay look? Which also then feeds back into the athlete's perspective. Like, I think my ability is very similar, not climbing ability, but like my ability to recognize like good belay technique is similar to other climbers. So if I see someone that has sloppy X, Y, Z, I'll say like, I'm a hes- I'm hesitant to climb bolt one, two, and three. But after that, I feel okay with you catching me like on a whip or something. But yeah, there, there'll be some that I'll, I'll say like, I can tell that they'll short rope me or I can tell that like they're hesitant. So it gives me hesitancy of performing super well. So similar to athletes, it's like the belayer's ability affects my ability to climb. So I, yeah. And like, I've done a lot of gym lead tests before and I know what to look for of like, okay, we'll do this quick exercise of like, take out slack, give out slack. Great. That looks fine. Oh, you're belay certified. Cool. Um, but yeah, if it's someone that I've never seen before, I definitely take a little bit more caution of, uh, I don't know who you are, but if it's one of my, if it's one of my belay friends, oh, I will, I will climb. I will whip off the first draw and feel okay. Oh, gosh. Okay. I know yeah. they I know they have me. So yes, I will say I'm cautious to the standard gym goer, but like for anyone that's on the competition belay circuit, I'm like, oh, this is fine. Like I will have a good ride either way. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, next one. Have you ever had to remove like a volunteer belayer after seeing that they did something wrong? Yeah, um, especially in the head belayer role, it's like if you see bad belay technique, like that's why we have the st- the pillars of consistency, safety, and pro- or safety, consistency, and professionalism. Um, at any point that I'm like, this person is talking way too much to climbers. Like, I do the climber doesn't need to have like a full on conversation about this. Like, I'll pull, uh, I'll either correct them. Like, hopefully, we have a conversation before you were pulled. But if it's a safety issue, um, yeah, I will pull that belayer from the round. And what we'll often say is like, I'll, uh, at any point, you could be relieved from the round. If that happens, you are welcome to con- like talk to us after the round has happened. So it's not like taking away from the um, from the field of play or just like the integrity of the field of play. So um, there, I think it was my first time I head belayed, which was a qualifying event near where I live um there was a very poor belayer um who had just learned how to lead belay and used to agree agree very poorly that both short roped multiple kids and then um unfortunately like the climber uh, there was one climber that hit uh, that um made contact with the ground um from like the second or third bolt and it was bad and I was like okay great immediately like this is no for me um we'll talk after the round and like like I said, we hopefully will have ability to give correction, but if it's something like that, it's just an immediate pull. So, yes, we will. I will not let someone that has um, hurt somebody or has been close to hurting somebody stay on a round because I want to keep the integrity of of the belay team that's currently there and then also just for the field of play. So, yes, that is a, that is a tool we use um, to better people. And also, sometimes pulling then adds to the conversation of this is how we can... Um, work towards better belay technique. I don't want to. I don't want people to leave uh, a belay round not knowing any better. I want them to uh, hopefully learn from their mistake, um, so that they can provide a better experience for belayers. Like I think everyone can, with the work, pr- uh, with providing work or with it putting work in, they're able to belay really well. It just takes practice, experience. To then get to that point rather than um, like, I don't, 
yeah, I don't think it, everyone's a lost cause. I think there is always room for growth. Um, and I, I try to communicate that to people that I hold as well. And there have been some people that I've been close to pulling or that have made a lot of correction. I'm like, wow, you've really improved over the last season. Like I can tell you've put in work and that's, that's always very good. I do really like that. And so with the short roping, um, I guess, does it ever happen to a point where people submit, uh, Oh my god what's it called um appeals like appeals yeah appeals for for it i have not experienced it in my career for belaying i know that it can happen and um usually it's hap- it happens in the moment where a climber on the wall will say short like short rope or like something along the lines or they can come down from a route and talk to a, a judge or a head judging official and say i've been short roped i personally haven't seen it um in my experience but i know i know there was one time my friend was uh wrongfully called for a short rope because the climber was actually stepping on the rope which they didn't know so they were calling they were pulling for rope and they couldn't pull anymore and they called for a short rope and the the player down there was just like i have slack in the system not calling out to the climber but just showing like We'll show with like a soft J, like, hey, there is slack in the system. You could pull this if you weren't stepping. So it can happen. I haven't experienced it. And if from my friend's experience, it, it can happen, but it can be wrongfully called. So short roping at the skill that we have now, you often won't see even on the regional or divisional scene. Okay, uh, last question. Uh, thoughts on the double fishermen's or Yosemite tuck? Are they used in comp climbing? Does it matter? Some gyms seem to take it very seriously. Yeah, for USA climbing within the rules, um, like you have to tie a, um, a figure eight follow through through both of your hard points with a, so- a safety knot at the end. And the reason for the safety knot is just to, to both denote that there's more than enough tail. Like if a if there's not enough tail, there's possibility it could untie itself. If there's a safety knot or stopper knot, that means that there is enough tail and it also won't go back through the system. It could be anywhere from an overhand knot, which is just a standard knot, a double fisherman's, which is kind of like a, a barrel knot on the on the tail or the working side, and then um, a Yosemite finish or a Yosemite tuck is using that tail and then tucking it back through the figurine itself. There are ways that you can tie it incorrectly, and there are ways you can tie it correctly. Um, visually, it's a lot harder for us, like in a quick check, to see a fish or to see a Yosemite finish correctly done, rather than a um, figure eight follow through with a stop or not. So, if I was recreationally climbing, I personally will use a Yosemite finish because I can untie it pretty well, but I often will just tie a regular figure eight with a little stopper Uh, but for competitions you have to have a figure eight with a stopper and you'll see it on you'll see it on all elite athletes that they have that on their knot um and if they don't i question that but yeah more more times than not yeah you'll see every athlete figure eight follow through just because it's it's easy to see it is harder to break but it's it's the easiest not to do a check on real quick okay makes sense um cool i think those are all the questions i had uh any like closing closing thoughts maybe this is a closing thought um the the way that or what i was talking about in terms of like repelling being or like canyoneering and repelling being kind of applicable to belaying the technique that you use for dynamic rope control almost directly as related to repelling because you're using the friction of your hand to lower yourself down at a certain speed, you're able to give yourself a consistent lower of yourself down. But you're kind of doing that on the floor um, when you're when you're using dynamic rope control to stay on the floor instead of being like lifted up or jumping up. Um, you kind of have the same repel technique. So <laughs> that's I don't know if that's something that can be fished in there, but like that's that's the reason why I brought up repelling or canyoneering is like those skills are actually really helpful um, to use, like just using the friction of your hands, lowering yourself down, like you're, yeah, to visually represent it as like, you're kind of lowering yourself down actively as you're catching the climber 
but you're staying on the ground the whole time and the climber is just coming down in a soft, safe manner. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining me today. Uh, is there anything else you want to shout out or if you want to let people know where they can find you if they have any further questions? Yeah, uh, just like shout outs to the people that have really impacted my belay career. Um, definitely want to give thanks to Ty Hardaway, who has now um, taken over the IFSC belay program in terms of the development. Uh, Steve Baker, who is the Uncle Steve to all of us. And then, uh, yeah, other people, part of the team, Toby Monroe, uh, C Lad, they're all people like you'll see on the belay team, we're all a family. Um, like we, we care a lot about not only belaying, but we care a lot about just humanity and people. So there are people that have really impacted me on my journey, not only like just belaying, but just personally. And then, yeah, yeah, you can find. I mean, I don't post much, but my, I have Instagram and I post a lot about like little belaying things on Noah underscore Kiwi, which is just a little ditty on my last name, which is Maka Evie. Kiwi just is a little bit easier to pronounce. And then, um, yeah, follow USA Belay if you want to see just ways to get involved. Feel free to like message USA Belay. We just put a little divisional post out of all the divisional championships that um, took photos of their belay teams. So I think that's really, it's really sweet to just see like um, the belay teams that are, uh, that are represented like throughout all nine divisions of USA climbing. It's like, Oh, they're, they're humans on the other side. And they're all like working towards this really cool project of um, serving athletes through safety, consistency and professionalism to, to better, not only the sport, like, as it's gaining a lot of traction for the the Olympics this year, 2028 Olympics, but it's like, yeah, these are not only parents of athletes, but just like people that are super into belaying like myself. So yeah, we're just, we're just a little bit, it's just a fun crew of individuals that come together. So USA belay is a very fun uh, way to interact. We also have a belayers page on USA climbing in ways. If people want to get more in depth or want to learn more, um, yeah, the community, the belayer section on the community page of USA Climbing is where you find a lot of curriculum that we've developed for for the public use. So those are those are aspects I can show. Yeah, I will link all of those below. Um, but yeah, thank you again. It was amazing to talk to you. Yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for making it to the end of the podcast. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed. Otherwise, you are a super fake climber. If you're listening on a podcasting platform, I'd appreciate if you rate it five stars and you can continue the discussion on the free competition climbing discord linked in the description. Thanks again for listening. Thank you.